All right, so this is the last part of the tapering jig. Now this isn't the original piece. This is something that somebody made. Um, it did a pretty good job. It's basically, it's a block of steel. It's got a hole, a through hole here for this threaded rod to go through. And the key part is here that you got this uh, area right here that's milled out to fit the V-way of the slave. Oh, uh, and of course there's a burr on the end here. All right, so like I was saying, this block fits over the uh, block fits over the back V-way. Slides on like this. Voila. All right, so now that I've got my tapering jig reassembled, I want to try and just go over the different components or the, the basic operation of the tapering jig. And the best way to explain that is to start by just uh, uh, setting everything as if I weren't using tapering jig and just doing normal cuts. And basically what, what happens is, and this is kind of self-explanatory, but if this lock is set, this lock will keep this bar right here from being able to move independently of the carriage. So it's basically it's locked. So when I move my um, when I move my cross slide, okay, my cross slide moves in and out because the end of the feed screw is attached to this block underneath here. Okay. Now, if I loosen this. unlock that block now this block can actually slide back and forth so now when I move my feed screw you'll see the cross slide still moving but now you'll see this is wiggling that's because what's happening is the reason why the cross slide is moving now is because this block still can't move but only because there is a long bolt here that goes through a hole in this block right and I can demonstrate that that block can now move freely if I actually move my taper. Well, I'm actually at the pivot point in the middle there, so I've got to run it back. I've got to run it down off to the side. All right. Now watch what happens to this block. See it moving in and out? And consequently, because it's moving in and out, and it's attached to the lead screw, it's actually moving the whole carriage in and out. Might not be very obvious on the video, but it is. Yeah, I can do it even more. There we go. More dramatically. There we go. Okay? And that's the basic operation, the basic principle that, that is behind the operation of the tape range. So. What happens now is, if we run the carriage down here, and we move this from its normal state of zero taper, which is actually a gauge on the side here, the little graduations on the side, it's kind of hard to read. But I'm going to put a really exaggerated taper in here, that's like really crazy. be easier to see it. So now I've set this for a very exaggerated taper. So what happens now, because I have this bracket right here locked, that keeps this piece from being able to move. Okay, which is this bar right here, can't move with the carriage. So as I move the carriage down, you see what's happening. This block now, which is riding the rails, so to speak, on this bar, is it has no choice but to move towards 
when I'm moving it down towards the headstock, it's moving in closer and moving this bar right here, which is actually moving my carriage out. So if, we, if you look right here where my finger is, you can actually watch it. All right, and then back the other way, it comes, okay? This is a carriage lock, okay? What this does is this gives a good positive lock between block and the carriage. That really locks all of this all together so that when cutting a taper, it doesn't have a tendency to want to move in or out and ruin your taper. But it's important to note that when this is locked, I can't move my crossfeed screw. Okay, because now this can't move independently of this at all. And this has to move independently. This, which is tied to the cross slide, has to move independently to this block with a with a cross feed screw is. So if I want to make an adjustment, increase my depth of cut, so to speak, I loosen that up. Reset my depth of cut. That's of course very exaggerated. Lock it again and take my next cut, my next pass. Okay. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. I'm not turning any tapers tonight, so. Um, not gonna do that. The other thing I wanted to talk about was this part right here and the hole in it and then there's a hole here and a set screw and if I'm not mistaken there's supposed to be a bar that goes in here is anchored here by the set screw and I think it would actually have a stop that's adjustable on it and I think that that's actually for cutting tapered threads. So I think it ends up being a thread stop for cutting threads when you're using the tapering jig. And those always seem to be missing. So for normal turning, I want to uh, I want to set this to zero. I want to lock this lock, and I want to unlock this. By unlocking this, I essentially allow this whole bar right here to travel freely on that so that as the carriage is moving back and forth, this top piece is not going to want to move independently of the bottom piece and it's basically going to not create any deviation whatsoever. So even if I didn't have this set at exactly zero degrees for some reason, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do anything. Plus it shouldn't because this is locked, but just to be kidding, you know on the safe side. I don't need to cut a taper anytime soon as far as I know so uh, like I said main thing is I wanted to actually uh, just get all these parts off the shelf and back on the lathe where they belong and uh, now that I put it all back together it strikes me that I gained this this lock for the uh, for the carriage for the cross slide so uh, if I'm taking heavy cuts now I can set my cut depth of cut reach over lock this take my cut and not worry about you know this moving out although I don't think it would but yeah you never know finally get around to cleaning this guard not gonna bother paint it, painting it since I didn't bother painting the rest of the lathe quite a while ago I actually bought a bunch of uh, belts at the flea market cheap and uh, got several that I thought were close to the range of what I need for this lathe and I never ended up installing them so I'm still using one of the belts that I just had I don't know if that was one of the ones that was on there when I got it or if it's just one I, I think the ones that were on there were pretty bad that's an old one too and I think that one no longer really it, it kind of like keeps its shape when you take it off so might as well put the new belts on. Plus there's only one and it's supposed to be two V-belts. Although I've never had that belt slip yet. The flat leather belt has slipped and needed to be tightened. But these V-belts have been rock solid. Or V-belt, I should say. So I already released the tension in the uh, belt here to get it off easier. The tensioner adjustment is moved way towards the back now. So 
I definitely would want a belt either this length or even shorter. I had actually measured this belt a while ago and totally forgot what the heck I came up with for a measurement. Something tells me I think it was about 41. What I found at the flea market that I got dirt cheap were these Master Mechanic V-belts um, from True Value Hardware and I only took what I could find in that, air, you know, kind of close to that size that I could find pairs. There were a lot of single belts, but I wanted pairs. So I got 39s, 42s, and 43s. Well, I think if I look at the 42, I think if the 42 might actually be even a little bit bigger than the belt that I have on there now. And since my tension adjustment so far back already, I, uh, I have doubts that I'm going to be able to get a larger belt to, uh, to work on here. So I'm probably going to have to go with the 39 and hope that I can loosen the tensioner enough to make that work. But just for the heck of it, let's see if... Oh, wait a minute. No, these are a little bit shorter, it looks like. Well, wait a minute, that's not fair. Comparison. Oh, yeah. Now the 42 is a little bit smaller. I think I can get by with the 42s. Oh, yeah, definitely. Matter of fact, I'm probably going to have to even loosen that even further just to get these on. The 43s are definitely going to be too big. Well, that one inch made a big difference. <laughs> All right, so the tension seems pretty good. Yeah, those belts, uh, being brand new, run just as uh, erratically as the ones that I took off. <laughs> I wonder, maybe those belts have been sitting around for a long, long time. I rotate it by hand. There's a right there. You can see it starts to ride high. It's kind of there's a deformity, especially in this outer belt here. It seems. I don't know whether or not with time, whether or not that'll work its way out or not. No indication that it's going to slip. Well, I can always tighten them up a little more. If uh, if it warrants it down the road. All right, well, I'm almost done with the Vernon lathe. I have one more project, and that's, uh, I'm not gonna do that today, but at some point, I'm gonna try and repair this handle that I broke by accident. And uh, right now, I've got actually this pulley on here because it was a perfect fit, and I'm using that as a handle, kinda corny. But, uh, and then also, uh, I was missing the set screw for this collar, so I had this. This looks like an, uh, I don't know what this is, some sort of an adjustment screw or something. It's plastic. 
but I just happened to come across this nice little knurled metal one looks much more proper you know the irony is this actually is more easy for me to grab but I don't know that just looks better kind of funny that I care how that looks considering I've got this V-belt pulley on there as a handle